بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله فيقتلون ويقتلون وعدا عليه حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بعهده من الله فاستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به وَذَٰلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ These are the verses of Surah At-Tawbah. In, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Allah, indeed Allah has purchased, has brought, has bought from the believers themselves and their wealth. Ourselves and our wealth have been purchased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what? بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ in lieu of Jannah, for them will be Jannah and paradise. And then it continues saying, they fight in the path of Allah, and thus they fight, they're killed. And wa'dan alayhi haqqa, this is a true and a confirmed promise from Allah that's mentioned in the Torah, the Evangel, and the Quran. And whoever fulfills this covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا so, Receive the glad tidings of your trade that you have done with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the ultimate win. This is the ultimate win and success. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made Jannah and Paradise the price of the believers and their wealth. In the sense that if they spend their wealth and themselves for the deen, then they are entitled to the reward which is paradise. He has made this covenant with them. And then after that, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established and confirmed this in a number of ways. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions then the description of the people who are fulfilling this, who are fulfilling this right, who are making good of their purchase. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, At-ta'ibun, those who make tawbah. Al-abidun, those who worship what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to worship, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-hamidun, who are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And As-sa'ihun. As-sa'ihun, this could refer to people who fast. It could also refer to people, Sa'iha comes from Siyaha. Siyah means to travel. So it could also mean traveling for the sake of Allah, which means traveling for the sake of studying your deen and learning more about your deen, learning more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some have said this refers to jihad. Some say this refers to traveling for hajj. So it could be for numerous reasons, any kind of travel for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, I mean, how do we make good of this purchase? is that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we fulfill his rights and we become true believers. That means we are then doing our part. Another thing is we know how great paradise is. When something is so great and there's a price that's placed for it, then that price is also going to be great. So what's the price? The price is the believer and his wealth. So this, in another sense, it actually shows us the really important position, the honor of the insan. That Allah has given the insan this position to be the price of paradise. See, sometimes if you don't understand, sometimes if you don't understand too much about the product, then see the kind of people who are purchasing that product. You'll get an idea of the utility of such a thing. Look at the price. So, a lot of people tell us that you know, some of these books that we publish, they're more expensive. But what's most interesting is that you've got a, 
one book published in Pakistan on you know or India on cheap paper and for three four pounds and you republish it in the UK in nicer paper good editing and everything and you keep the price seven eight pounds and you'll sell more of those because in people's minds when there's a cost attached to something it means that there's some value if you give those books out for free there'll be less of the people who will receive it will actually read it so you 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 sell a hundred books even for whatever price and you give a hundred books out for free among the 200 pe- among the hundred people who got it for free very few will read it they'll say oh i've got it just put it on the side right some may be willing to read it you know some really a person who's really interested and those who buy it because they've given something for it then they feel that they must get something out of it and they're only going to buy it if there's a if they have a certain motivation to buy it when it's free everybody just picks up a copy and then it just goes somewhere in the dust so likewise this is how you look at these things so you look at the one who's selling you look at the people who are buying you look at the price and then you get a good idea of the commodity so in this case what do you have you have the product itself the commodity which is for sale is Jannah well rather we look at it the other way the commodity for sale here that Allah has purchased is our nafs the purchaser is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the price for it the price for it is Jannah is Jannah and the one who is the ambassador who is the representative the one who is going and making this deal the rep is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the angels because they're all part of letting us know about this in uh, Sunan of Tirmidhi Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu relates Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said man khafa adlaja wa man adlaja balagh al-manzil the one who fears then he's going to make an effort and wake in those last portions of the night and do something and strive and whoever does that he's going to reach the goal if you're going to travel then you can't sleep at night you may have to even travel at night you may have to get up early to miss the traffic and travel so it's a similar kind of idea those who come for fajr those who do tahajjud prayer those who try balagh al-manzil they will reach the goal they will reach their destination Allah in Allahi Ghaliya. Know that the merchandise of Allah is expensive. The merchandise that Allah has is expensive. Allah in Allahi Al Jannah. And know that this merchandise is paradise. Abu Nu'im in his book called Kitabu Sifat Al Jannah, he relates from Anas Allahu Anhu that an Arabi, a desert Arab, a Bedouin, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Ma Thamanul Jannah. You know, you get this kind of a question from them. Give me the price for paradise. What is it? What's the price? So Rasulullah sallallahu said, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Numerous ahadith like this. There's another hadith that's related by Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that this Bedouin came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya Rasulullah, dullani ala amalin idha amiltuhu dakhaltul jannah. Now look at their very black and white, very straight forward way of dealing with these issues. He says, Ya Rasulullah, indicate to me a deed which if I do, I'll enter Jannah. Just tell me something if I do, I'll enter Jannah. Now listen carefully. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, Ta'budullah wa la tushrik, tushriku bihi shay'a. You will worship Allah without ascribing any partners to Him. Wa tuqimu salah al maktuba. You will establish the prescribed prayers, the five prescribed prayers. Wa tu'ti zakat al mafruda. And you will give the obligatory zakat, the alms, the poor Jew. What the summa Ramadan? And you will fast a month of Ramadan. So this person said, Khalas. He says, By the one in whose hands is my life, I will not increase upon this at all forever. And neither will I decrease. I'll do exactly this. And then he turned away. He, dis- he went away. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about him, مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ رَجُلْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ هَذَا Whoever it gladdens and makes happy that they, they look at a person of Jannah, then look at this man. Like when he said that, he was going to do that. He said he was going to do that. In the Sahih of Muslim then, from Jabir radiallahu anhu, 
It says that an numan ibn Qawqal, his name was an numan ibn Qawqal, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, ara'ayt idha sallaytu al-maktuba wa harramtu al-haram wa ahlaltu al-halal adkhul jannah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you think? If I make my fard prayers, I make the haram as haram, meaning I treat the haram as haram, and I treat the halal as halal, will I enter Jannah? Rasulullah said, said, of course. Like he, stay within the boundary, halal il halal, haram is haram, and I'm doing my prayers. In Sahih Muslim from Uthman ibn Affan, another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, now these are all the hadith, these are some of the narrations he's bringing, which tell us about the actions that take a person to Jannah, if you do them properly. Now many of us may be doing a lot of these actions, but we have problems. So inshallah, eventually we will get to Jannah. But if we are very particular about these actions and don't go beyond these boundaries, then Jannah will be immediate. That's the point. So in this hadith, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anh, says, Man mata, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man mata wa huwa ya'lam an la ilaha illallah dakhal al-jannah. Anybody who passes away, who dies, while knowing that there is no God except Allah, that's a firm belief in their heart, they will enter Jannah. Meaning one day they have to go to Jannah. That is the ticket, the minimal ticket. Yes, it may be years and years and years where they may have to be burn in the hellfire. That's a possibility. But one day they will enter Jannah. In the Musnad and Sunan Nabi Dawood from Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he says that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Anybody whose final words are لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ They will enter Jannah. That's why a munafiq will not be able to say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ on his deathbed. I don't care how bad a person has been. But if just before dying he can say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That means he's going somewhere. He's got iman in his heart. Because that's a moment when you can't say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ You can't make it up. You can't fake it. There's no pretense at that time. It's the reality. Everything is overcome at that time. So a person may say, La ilaha illallah, but then after that, he may not die straight away. It's when they're about to die, just before they're dying, unless they enter into some kind of terminal uh, coma or something of that nature. Any La ilaha illallah, that means it's very, very important. Very important. That's why they say that there are certain sins which uh, are more detrimental they cause a person to forget the kalima on their deathbed one of them is drinking drinking is a massive problem drinking wine beer these you know the intoxicants some people take it as lucy just because people do it so casually it doesn't make it halal it says that this is such a bad it's ummul khaba'ith it's one of the it's the one of the mothers of all kinds of filth and all kinds of evil. It's the pathway to all forms of sin. You just give somebody a drink and then that's it. You know, make them, shaitan makes them do whatever it is. So people who even casually drink thinking it's okay. It's okay over a dinner meeting, a lunch meeting with a client, just to, fe- just to fit in or whatever the case is. It's, it's detrimental. It makes, it deprives a person of the kalima. Even if the person's praying sometimes. Even if the person does his salat. It's just this provides a blockage, a prevention, an obstacle. Allah prevent, Allah protect us. Likewise with other sins. Then in Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Dharr radiallahu anhu, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said once that a, somebody came to me from my Lord. A messenger came to me from my Lord and told me or gave me the glad tidings that man mata min ummatik, whoever dies from your ummah who has not committed shirk in any way will enter Jannah. So then I asked, the Prophet ﷺ said, I wanted to confirm. So I asked, wa in zana wa in sarak? Even if he's committed zina, and even if he's uh, committed theft and stolen, will he still enter Jannah? He says, wa in zana wa in sarak? Even though. Which means eventually they will. Unless Allah, for some reason, wants to forgive him right off. But otherwise, they will eventually enter Jannah. There's numerous hadith like this that we come across most of the time. I'm not going to go through all of them right now. Just finally, Abu Nu'im relates this hadith from Jabir radiallahu anhu. He said, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Now, 
until now we've been talking about all of these deeds that help you to get to Jannah. Now this hadith is saying from Jabir, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said, nobody's actions will enter him into Jannah. لا يدخل أحد منكم عمله الجنة. None of you will be entered into Jannah by his deeds. ولا يجيره من النار. And neither will it protect you from the fire. ولا أنا. Neither me, the Prophet sallallahu said. Neither will that do do it for me. إلا بتوحيد الله. Except through declaring the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Now. This is important to understand this, to reconcile this matter. You have all of these deeds that are mentioned as helping people go into Jannah. And then you have this hadith saying that, no, it's not your deeds that will take you into Jannah. So let's cover this uh, once and for all. What it is, is that a person will only enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't matter what kind of deeds they have. It's only through the mercy of Allah they'll enter. That's one thing. So, Jannah can only be entered through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to the deeds, they are a cause, but not the only cause. They are, the, they are a cause, but they're not the only cause. They're not a cause that, bus, that's it, once you do deeds, you will have to enter Jannah. No, that's not the case. They definitely then invoke the mercy of Allah. And thus, with Allah's mercy, you enter. So deeds are definitely a cause and a source for the mercy of Allah. So deeds themselves, what Allah wants us, so why, what's the problem here then? You do deeds, invoke the mercy of Allah, and Allah will enter you into Jannah. So that means deeds did invoke you into Jannah. The thing is that don't rely too much on your deeds, rely on the mercy of Allah. But you can't have the mercy of Allah without deeds, because that's empty. The hadith mentions that the foolish one is the one who allows his self to go in pursuance of its desires and then just has all of these hopes in Allah. Like Allah is merciful. Allah is kareem brother, what's the problem? Allah is rahim. Allah is the most merciful. He's got this many, uh, uh, you know, this much mercy he's withheld to him for himself. That's tamanna ala Allah. That's just false pretenses. That's just false hopes. So as long as a person is doing the deeds, but while he's doing the deeds, it's about ikhlas. I'm doing these deeds for the sake of Allah. So it's really, really sophisticated, very important to understand see, this. Another way to look at this is people like Sufyan al-Thawri, the way they explain this is, they said, كَانُوا يَقُولُونَ النَّجَاتُ مِنَ النَّارِ بِعَفْوِ اللَّهِ وَدُخُولُ الْجَنَّةِ بِرَحْمَتِهِ وَاقْتِسَامُ الْمَنَازِرِ وَالدَّرَجَاتِ بِالْأَعْمَالِ this really provides a good clarification. If this, has been, this issue has been bothering you for a while, he says that the ulama used to say that safety from the hellfire is, by, is through the forgiveness of Allah. Entry into paradise is through His mercy. However, once that you get inside Jannah, you've been away from hell, you're in Jannah through the mercy of Allah, your actions now will determine where you go in Jannah. So entry into paradise has to come from Allah as His mercy. But then depending on where you go in paradise, that is based on your amal. And of course, there's an aspect of that that comes from Allah's mercy as well. But your actions will not go in vain. They won't be redundant. They will decide for you where you go in Jannah. And that is uh, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, which will come later on in detail. I'm not going to mention it right now because it's quite lengthy. But basically, it mentions in there at the end, أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ Or actually, it's the beginning. أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ إِذَا دَخَلُوهَا نَزَلُوا فِيهَا بِفَضْلِ أَعْمَالِهِمْ When the people of Jannah enter Jannah, they will then be located based on the virtue of their deeds. So it's only once you get in that your deeds suddenly say, okay, this is my place. This is my place. Like the Mujahideen have the hundred degrees and this person has this degree and this person, whoever, uh, it says that whoever avoids an argument even though he's on the right, on the truth, he gets a place in the uppermost parts of Jannah. Right? So that deeds will then take you inside as to where to go. The ticket has to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala though. 
The other point which is a bit more grammatical and uh, interesting, uh, you'll have to pay some attention for this one, is that what you have is the word in Arabic is ba, bil a'mal, with deeds. What do you mean by with? What does the ba refer to? Sometimes the word ba, the letter ba in Arabic is used to show the price of something. I bought this for this much. Price of something. Sometimes the ba comes to show the cause for something. This happened because of this. In Arabic, the word ba, the letter ba is used for both these meanings. I purchased this for 10 pounds, right? Or this happened due to this suburb. So what we have then is dukhul, enter into paradise, is the ba there refers to the suburb as in the cause for it is Allah and His mercy. And then ba, you can buy a place in paradise based on your deeds. That's the price you pay. The Prophet ﷺ does this in a number of ahadith where he uses the word wow. But it actually shows two different possible meanings. For example, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, a Muslim relates this hadith, Saddidu wa qaribu wa abshiru. Uh, hit the mark, get close, and then take the glad tidings. Which means when you're doing deeds, then try to do the right deeds. Don't aim in a completely different direction. If you hit the mark, alhamdulillah, if you don't, at least you'll get close. Then seek the glad tidings. Any mistakes, Allah will forgive. If you're aiming in the wrong direction completely, then you're not going to get anywhere. Then, this is the important part. Wa'lamu, know that none of you, none of you will be saved by his deeds. Wa'lamu anna ahadam minkum lan yanjua bi amalih. None of you will be saved by his deeds. B. None of you will be saved because of your deeds. قَالُوا وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Neither you, Ya Rasulullah. قَالَ لَا Nor me, except that Allah إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِي اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ Allah has uh, covered me in His mercy. So that's quite clear. Essentially what Ibn al-Qayyim is saying, whoever recognizes, whoever knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he has seen the truth, and he's witnessed this, and he's also witnessed his own shortcomings, sins, sinful state. And when he's figured this out with his heart and he's true to himself, then he will realize that at the end of the day, it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who we can seek assistance from. Because whatever deeds I've got, but then if I look at my shortcomings within those deeds and just in general, then I need Allah's mercy because these deeds will not cut it. The next, he's got a special chapter here, chapter 20. Uh, this chapter is, um, I mean, I, I have uh, skipped some chapters which are purely based on academic discussions. And many of you would get very bored about that because paradise seems to be a very exciting idea. And if I throw into you these academic discussions, you think this is not paradise for me. This is sitting in an exam, right? What I do want to do, make dua for me, is that this is a very large book. What I want to do, inshallah, is to, uh, uh, to make a concise edition of this work, which means to remove all of these academic and uh, language discussions and just mention the hadith under the chapters, just to get a bus vivid graphic depiction. So that it's just shorter, easier to handle, and inshallah, more people inshallah, can benefit from it. It will be an Arabic uh, work. But anyway, this next chapter is a very interesting, you can tell that this, the author Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah has really thought about everything and pondered over this. So this chapter is about the people of Jannah seeking Jannah from their Lord. Jannah seeking them. Now, did you know that was possible? Jannah seeking its inhabitants and coming to your help, intercession. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, look, this man, he used to do this, that and the other. That's why allow him to come into Jannah. <coughs> this just increases our hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, subhanallah, he, uh, I'm just going to mention to you the narrations here. 
Of course, Allah's servants, they want Jannah. The angels are asking for paradise for the, for the, for the believers. The Jannah is asking Allah for its inhabitants. And of course, the people, they are asking for Jannah. So the messengers are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give it to them and their followers. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will est uh, stand all of these people up in front of the Jannah. And Jannah, these people, all of these categories of people will intercede for the believers. Now this obviously is only to reveal and display Allah's mercy, Allah's generosity and Allah's honoring people. Because for Allah to give something, it's just a demand of His name. The demand of Allah's name of Rahim, of Jawad, the generous one. All of this, His names and His attributes, Jannah coming to us, it's all part of that. So there's no way it's not going to happen. It has to happen. But as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Jawad which means extremely generous. He has huge generosity. All of generosity is his. He loves to be asked and for, him, for people to seek from him, for people to turn to him. So what he has done is he has created people to ask him and then inspired them to ask him. Anybody who asks from Allah is muwaffaq, has tawfiq. Which means Allah has something special in store for them. A person who cannot ask, it means they're not getting the tawfiq to ask. They're not being inspired to ask. Those who can make dua and who can ask Allah, they have been inspired to ask. That in itself is part of the generosity and the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he created people and then he inspired them to ask. He is the creator of the one who is asking. He is the creator of the question, of the asking itself. And he is also the creator of what you're asking for. And the only reason he's doing all of this is because he loves to be asked. So he created the asker, the thing being asked, the asking itself. He loves people who ask him. And he gets angry if somebody doesn't ask him. The most beloved of creation to Allah is the one who asks him the most. The one who asks him most frequently and who asks him for the greatest of things. The bigger that you ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closer you become to him. He loves yuhibbul mulihina fi dua. He loves those people who are persistent in their dua. He loves those people. Anybody who persists, he loves them and then he gives them. That's why hadith says that whoever doesn't ask Allah, he gets angry on them. That's why a poet says, لا تسألن بني آدم حاجة وسل الذي أبوابه لا تحجب وسل الذي أبوابه لا تحجب الله يغضب إن تركت سؤاله وبني آدم حين يسأل يغضب Do not ever ask of the children of Adam your needs. Ask the one whose doors are never veiled or closed. Allah becomes angered if you abandon asking Him. Whereas the children of Adam, when they are, when they are asked, they become angry. For example, I was very, very busy. And a few people got some emails and phone calls. There's some counseling issues. Now, counseling, counseling is very demanding. It's very engaging. You can't just do a five-minute, half-an-hour counseling. It requires hours sometimes. Listen to both sides of the story, bring everybody together, make the time convenience. So I would just say, I don't have the time. Please go somewhere else. Because if I can't do it, then there's no point in me saying yes and then not doing it. There's one individual, he met me somewhere in a masjid and he asked. And I said, I don't have any time, sorry. He saw me again, I think. He asked me again. I said, I'm sorry. He called me. And 
eventually after asking me three, four, five times, I could just see that this is a very, very important issue. So I managed to find a bit of time. At the end of the day, when you keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will get it. And He just loves it because He's just seeing how much you really need it. You ask Him once or twice, you dictate a few uh, demands, I want this, I want that, and then see, do you really want it? Ask again. Are you going to get tired? Let's see how much you need it. فَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ He says, أَيُّ جِنَايَ Which crime, which crime, which evil deeds are these that make a person's iman corrupt, that corrupt a person's deen, who come between the person's heart and the recognition of his Lord and his names and his complete attributes. Alhamdulillah الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله All praises to Allah who guided us to this that we must ask him, that he must be asked. The, the asker is created by him and the asking is created by him and what we're asking for is also created by him. He just wants us all to be associated with him. So all praises to Allah who guided us to this understanding and we would not have been guided if Allah had not guided us. This is a verse of the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf. So Abu Nu'im relates from Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu Ma min muslimin yas'alu Allah al-jannata thalathan Now these are the hadith about it. Any Muslim who asks Allah for paradise three times, Jannah says, as soon as you ask three times, Jannah gets whiff of this somehow, right? And it says, Allahumma adkhilhu al-jannah Oh Allah, enter him into Jannah. وَمَنْ اسْتَجَارَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ النَّارِ ثَلَاثًا قَالَتِ النَّارِ اللَّهُمَّ أَجِرْهُ مِنَ النَّارِ And whoever seeks refuge in Allah from the hellfire three times, hellfire says, Oh Allah, give him refuge from the hellfire. Allah doesn't want us to ask once, at least three times. There's other hadith about this as well. Imam Tirmidhi relates this hadith, so does Imam Nasai and Ibn Majah, etc. Um, there's another hadith that's related from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ma sa'ala Allahu 'abdun al-jannata fi yawmin sab'a marratin illa qalat al-jannah ya rabbi inna 'abdaka fulan sa'alani fadkhulnihi any person any servant of Allah who asks for jannah 7 times in a day then jannah says oh my lord your such and such a servant has asked for me so enter give him entry Abu Ya'la al-Mawsili, he relates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, مَسْتَجَارَ عَبْدُ مِنَ النَّارِ سَبْعَ مَرَّاتٍ إِلَّا قَالَتِ النَّارِ I mean similar hadith that any servant who seeks refuge from the hellfire seven times, the hellfire says, Oh my Lord, your servant, so and such a person, has sought refuge from me, so give him refuge. And likewise, seven times asking for Jannah. The Jannah says, Oh my Lord, your such and such a servant, has asked for me, so enter him into Jannah. These ahadith are sahih. So, asking Allah seven times, Oh Allah, grant us Jannah. Oh Allah, grant us Jannah. Oh Allah, grant us all Jannah al firdaus Oh Allah, grant us all Jannah al firdaus 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 That's definitely seven. That means, hell, uh, uh, sorry, Jannah has taken our name. It's taken our name, which means, inshallah, something good. It's, yeah, I remember that name, you know. That name is important, that Jannah has taken our name, inshallah. Another hadith is related from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَكْثِرُوا مَسْأَلَةَ اللَّهِ الْجَنَّةِ See, it was three first, then you get seven. Now, saying, abundantly ask for, Allah, for Jannah. Abundantly ask Allah for Jannah and seek His refuge from the hellfire. فَإِنَّهُمَا شَافِعَتَانِ مُشَفَّعَتَانِ They are both intercessors whose intercessor, intercession is accepted. They are among the approved ones. That if they intercede for anybody, they're on the approved list and they will, uh, Allah will approve the intercession. وَإِنَّ الْعَبْدِ إِذَا أَكْثَرَ مِنْ مَسْأَلَةِ اللَّهِ الْجَنَّةِ قَالَتِ الْجَنَّةِ And the similar hadith that if a servant 
continues to abundantly ask Allah for Jannah. Jannah says, Ya Rab Abduka Hadha Ladi Sa'alanik Fa Askinhu Iyaya. He's asked you for me, so give him, uh, make him live in me. And likewise, the Hellfire says the same. However, there were some people among the pious predecessors. They had a slightly different approach to this. They had a slightly different approach to this. What was their approach? لا يسألون الله الجنة They wouldn't ask for Jannah. Instead, they would say, حسبنا الله أن يجيرنا من النار. It's enough for us from Allah that He just save us from the hellfire. Maybe fear was dominant there. It's like, as long as I'm not in the hellfire, that's big enough. Among them was uh, one individual whose name was Abu Sahba. Silat ibn Ashyam, Abu Sahba, Silat ibn Ashyam, Al Basri, he was Al Abid, Al Zahid, uh, the husband of Mu'adha Al Adawiyya. He died in 162 Hijri in a battle. Once he performed Salat all night until, uh, until morning, then he raises his hands and he says, Allahumma ajirni min al nar. Oh Allah, give me refuge from the hellfire. Somebody like me, can they be bold enough to ask you for paradise? See, their whole perspective was that they were so concerned. Of course Allah will give them paradise. Where is He going to put them? If He doesn't put them in hellfire, if that dua is, where is He going to put them? It's just different perspectives. We'll just go with the hadith for now. If somebody is so moved not to ask for Jannah, that's their personal, individual feeling. That's up to them. But the hadith tells us, ask for Jannah. That's why Anas radiallahu anh relates from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Unzuru fi diwani abdi. Look among the records of my servants. فَمَنْ رَأَيْتُمُوهُ سَأَلَنِ الْجَنَّةِ أَعْطَيْتُهُ Anybody, just check, do a search. Paradise. You know, Paradise. Anybody who's been seeking paradise, keywords, seek paradise. Anybody whose records that's found in, I'm going to give it to him. So it's well worth it that we put that in our records. We keep asking for Jannah. And anybody who's sought my refuge from hellfire, I will give it to him. That's the other search. Atta says, Kafani ayuji rani min al nar. It is sufficient for me that Allah. Uh, gives me protection from the hellfire. There was a hadith at the beginning from uh, Muawiyah ibn Salih, from Abdul Malik ibn Bashir, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No day passes except that Jannat and Jahannam ask from Allah. Jannah says, Ya Rabb, qad taab thimari My f- fruits and my flowers are in full bloom. Completely ripe for the taking. وَطَّرَدَتْ anhari, My rivers are in full flow. And وَشْتَقْتُ إِلَىٰ أَوْلِيَائِي I'm just waiting for my friends. I'm just desiring my friends. فَعَجِّلْ إِلَيَّ بِأَهْلِي Bring quick my, my inhabitants. So Jannah, clearly it's a very smart Jannah. It actually seeks out its people it seeks out its inheritors and it's going to on the day of judgment it's going to somehow suck everybody in it's going to find you likewise hellfire is like that as well that's the problem and i seek refuge in allah that there's no argument between them two on that day i hope that jannah for me is more powerful and for all of us that we just get swept in that direction there's not a tug of war no, I need to take him to Jahannam because he used to do this. He never prayed. He drank, womanized, enjoyed himself in haram ways. Jannah says, but he used to come to the masjid. He used to pray Friday prayers. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to remember Jannah and not forget Jannah and Jahannam. Abu Bakr al-Shafi'i he relates that from uh, the hadith of Qulayb ibn Hazan who says that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying 
Utlubul Jannata Juhdakum. Seek paradise, seek paradise with your complete effort. Put everything behind seeking paradise. Wahribu min nar juhdakum. And run away from the hellfire as much as you can. فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ لَا يَنَامُ طَالِبُهَا Because the, the characteristic of the person who seeks Jannah is someone who doesn't sleep. Because he spends night doing something for Allah. وَإِنَّ النَّارَ لَا يَنَامُ هَارِبُهَا And the person who wants to escape from Jahannam, he's not going to be a person who's sleeping. Otherwise it's going to come upon him. He's going to be constantly on the move. وَإِنَّ الْآخِرَةَ الْيَوْمِ مَحْفُوفَ بِالْمَكَارِهِ The Akhirah today is all covered up with undesirable things. وَإِنَّ الدُّنْيَا مَحْفُوفَ بِالْلَذَّاتِ Whereas the dunya is just is, is, com, is completely overgrown and full of different forms of attractions. فَلَا تُلْهِيَنَّكُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ تُقَرِّبُ الْمَسَافَ وَالشَّهَوَاتِ it makes all of these haram desires close to you. Let it not make you heedless of the akhirah. If only these words can really find a place in our hearts. We hear them so much. If only these words can find a place in our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. The next section is about the 10, 12 different names of Jannah. Let's see if we can quickly do this section. Firstly, the word Jannah itself, which is the most popular name that everybody goes by. The word Jannah uh, comes from a meaning of something hiding something, concealing something, right? A sitr wa taghtiya. That's why you have the word Janin, is an embryo. The embryo is hidden in the stomach. That's why you call it janin. Right? Then you have jan. Jan is the jinn. Because they're hidden from human eyes, that's why they're called jinn. That same word, jinn, jim, noon, comes from the same word. Mijan. Mijan is a shield because it protects you. It covers you. So the same kind of meaning. Majnoon. That also comes from the same meaning. Majnoon means the, the insane one because... His akal has been, there's a barrier, it's, it's concealed. You can't use it. And then you have the, another jan, which is a snake. A, such a very small, subtle snake that moves around, you can't tell. Uh, that's why uh, all of these, the word comes from jinn. And same thing, jannah. So why is jannah called jannah then? What's so hidden about? Well, it's hidden from our eyes right now. But the main thing is that it has got so lush greenery and vegetation, so beautiful that it will be just green covering. That's why you call uh, orchard today, you call that a jannah as well, a garden, because it's got so much greenery that is covering the ground what's underneath it. Because that's where you get beauty from. You know, you get this over, uh, not overgrown as such, but heavily, uh, you know, heavily uh, planted uh, uh, different forms of trees and everything else. That's why we understand, that's why many people just translate it as the gardens, the gardens of the hereafter, because it's going to be nat natural, it's not going to be concrete. Do you understand? It's just going to be natural, right? You say about weather, weather, you don't have to worry about these things, right? The other names here, the second name is Darus Salam, the abode of peace. Allah says, Lahum Darus Salami Inda Rabbihim. Right. For them is the abode of peace by their Lord. Surah Al-An'am, Surah Yunus. Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. Allah is inviting towards the abode of peace. It's the, an, a completely appropriate name for it because it is an abode of peace and safety from all forms of difficulties, tests and trials, calamities, anything undesirable. It's the house of Allah. Nothing happens there that's wrong. It's the house of Allah. And Allah's name is Salam. So you call it Darus Salam. It's called Darus Salam. And likewise, the greeting in there will be Tahiyyatuhum Fiha Salam, Surah Yunus. Their greeting in there will be Salam, peace. That will be the, the, the word. That will be the motto there, peace. Wal Malaikatu Yadkhuluna Alayhim min kulli bab, Salamun Alaykum. The angels will come and enter upon them from every door saying, Peace be upon you. That's the theme there is all peace. 
It's just going to be, you're going to hear it all over the place. Peace. Al-Ra'd. Surah Al-Ra'd. Allah says, لَهُمْ فِيهَا فَاكِهَةً وَلَهُمْ مَا يَدْدَعُونَ سَلَامٌ قَوْلًا مِّنْ رَبِّ الرَّحِيمٌ In there, they will have fruits. They will have whatever they desire. Salamun. Again, a word of peace. قَوْلًا مِّنْ رَبِّ الرَّحِيمٌ A word, a special word from the Lord who is most merciful. So everything will be in there with salam. There will be no shouting, screaming, no vulgarity, no insanity, nothing of this nature. No corruption. It'll just be just absolute purity. لا يسمعون فيها لغوًا إلا سلاما. They will not hear any, uh, anything strange, weird sounds or voices or discussions. Only peaceful things. Number three, Darul Khuld. No doubt. The abode of permanence. Once you go in there, there's no coming out. You know, there's no mistake. You go in there, there's no mistake. Sorry, wrong booking. No. You know, that's it. Ata'un ghayru majdhud. As Allah says, Surah Hud. It's, it's, a, it's a proper giving from Allah. Gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna hadha la rizquna ma lahu min nafad. This is our sustenance. There's no ending of it. Ukuluha da'imun wa dhilluha. Its fruits and everything are permanent. Its food is all permanent and so are its shade. وَمَا هُمْ مِنْهَا بِمُخْرَجِينَ Surah Al-Hijr They are not to be taken out of there again. Just let us do our best to get inside. Then after that, no worry. Uh, the fourth name is Darul Muqama. Muqama comes from Iqama, a place of stay, an abode of residence. That's what it means, Darul Muqama, an abode of residence. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّا الْحَزَنِ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا لَغَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ أَلَّذِي أَحَلَّنَا دَارَ الْمُقَامَةِ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ The one who has allowed us to stay in this Darul Muqama with His grace. يَعْنِي أَنزَلْنَا دَارَ الْخُلُودِ It's uh, an abode of permanence. That will, they stay in there for, for permanent. Number five, جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى مأوى. مأوى means an abode of safety. A place where you eventually resort to. The Jannatul Ma'wa, the place of uh, the Jannah, where people will eventually find their, uh, their safety. Indaha Jannatul Ma'wa, they will find their refuge and their abode. It's an abode. Indaha Jannatul Ma'wa in Surah Al Najm. Here, the Jannah التي يأوي إليها جبريل والملائكة. It's the Jannah to which the Jibril and the other angels they go. It's the Jannah تأوي إليها أرواح الشهداء. It's also the Jannah in which the souls of the Shuhada they go to, you know, until the day of judgment, they, they go to this Jannah. Number six, Jannatu Adn. Jannatu Adn. Jannatu Adn, again, is the name for all of the Jannah. And the reason is that the word Adn means to stay somewhere, to become resident somewhere. Similar to the, the previous word, al muqama. Right? So, adan means, adana means aqama, adana bil makan. For those who understand Arabic, idha aqama bil makan. Adantu al balad, tawattantuhu. When you make a place your residence, your place, your abode. So, jannatu adan. These are essentially, these are not gardens that are temporary, these are gardens of permanent residence. That's what Allah is telling us by these names, Adan. You will be there forever. That's why Allah says in Surah Maryam, Jannati Adn Lati Wa'ad al Rahmanu Ibadahu Bil Ghaib. In another verse in Fatir, Jannatu Adn Yad Khulunaha Yuhallawna Fiha Min Asawira Min Dhahabin Walu'lu Walibasuhum Fiha Harir. These are the gardens of permanence, of a residence. They will enter into it, then they will be adorned with bangles and other uh, uh, gold jewelry and pearls and their clothing in there will be pure silk. Number seven, Darul Hayawan. Wa inna al-akhirata lahi al-hayawan. Hayawan means the true life, the real life, the life which no death. That's what it refers to. So it's also called al-hayawan. Then how many have we done? Seven names. The eighth name is Al-Firdaus. Firdaus, Allah says, Surah Al-Mu'minun, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسَ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ 
These are the true inheritors. They will inherit the, the firdaus. They will remain in, remain in there permanently. Allah also says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ نُزُولَ Surah Al-Kahf, very those people who believe and did good deeds, for them are the gardens of firdaus, which is given them as hospitality, a place to stay. The meaning of firdaus is bustan, it means a garden, right? Faradis. Basatin, it's the plural. Uh, generally, though, bus, uh, firdos from a linguistic point, according to Kaab, he says, well, bustan anab. It's a garden or an orchard that has a lot of grapes, vines, right? Vines, good, good wine, the wine of the hereafter. And hence, Lay says, al firdos jannah thatu kurum. Essentially, that has lots and lots of grapevines in there. That's what it means. Wallahu alam. That means the wine up there is going to be really good in Firdaus. It's going to have the best wines. You know, today they, they, they go to restaurants based on what kind of wines they serve. First class, business class, you know, what wines do they serve? This is a big deal for people who are into this kind of stuff. Right? And even if you don't drink wine, you pick this thing up because it's talking about wines all the time. Right? In reviews and things like this. So if you want good wine, Jannatul Firdaus. That wine will not intoxicate. Absolute pure wine. Just wait for it. If you can go with, from this world thinking that I have not tasted wine, subhanallah, what a great feeling. I have not committed zina. Right? I've never touched, you know, intimately a woman that I'm not supposed to touch. And I've not had any wine. You know, hopefully that has something in, in the hereafter. Number nine, Jannatul Naim. Naim obviously means bounties. Inna ladina amanu wa amilu salihati lahum Jannatul Naim. Those people who believe and do good deeds, they have Jannatul Naim. Again, this refers to all the Jannah because all of the Jannah have bounties. So it's not speaking about us. You know, some people try to categorize. Firdaus is separate, yes, we know. But many of these others, they're just general names for all the Jannah because all of these Jannah are for, bound, for uh, bounties. Because they will have all of these wonderful things in there, beautiful things to see. These are all bounties from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tenth name is Al Maqamul Ameen. In the Muttaqina fi Maqamin Ameen. Surah Al Dukhan. Maqamun Ameen, the safe abode. The safe abode. It's safe in there because there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about even on yourself. You will never perish. You will never become old. You will never wither. And everything else. That's why Allah said, المتقين في مقام أمين يدعون فيها بكل فاكهة آمنين They will safely ask for anything that they want without any fear of any kind of retribution or rejection. Another name, 11 and 12, مقعد صدق and قدم صدق These are both used in the Quran. إن المتقين في جنات ونهر في مقعد صدق In the true place of seat, seating. In the, in the truthful abode. That's uh, another meaning for it. That's what it is. And that ends our names. That was 12 names, 12 references to Jannah, as mentioned in the Quran. And inshallah, uh, for um, the, the next section here is uh, the, how many uh, the types of Jannah there are. Uh, that is not the names, but how many types physically made up of different things, gold and silver and all that is mentioned in the Quran. That's the next section. 